Batman and the Outsiders was one of DC's top books in the 1980s. Volume 2 includes insight into the origins of Halo and Metamorpho, a time travel story, a tie-in with the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, and more. Not to mention plenty of Mike W. Barr wordplay and great art from Jim Aparo and others. This week, John Trumbull, who discussed Outsiders Volume 1 with me two years ago, returns to do a deep dive into Volume 2. Don't forget, you can support the podcast by pledging a few bucks a month at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Or, if you'd rather give a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal by sending it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. This is Tim. And this is John Trumbull. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo, and John Trumbull is joining us from New Jersey. How's it going? I'm doing okay. How are you doing, Tim? Good to talk to you again. Yeah, second time John's been on. First time was already two years ago uh, when we talked about the first volume of Batman and the Outsiders, and this time we're talking about volume two. Um, And, of course, this is the... you know I. Listeners, this show would probably know I was not really a DC reader growing up, so uh, I never read these until now. And we talked about the first volume; that was the first time I'd read that. And then I was kind of interested in, okay, then what what happens with ta- with uh, Halo? What's her mm-hmm. origin? So, going ahead to volume two here, two years later, um, <laughs> we get a lot more into Halo in this volume. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's all kind of explained, but but yeah, this volume, of course, it's all written by uh, Mike Barr, and uh, so the artist, you know, at the start was Jim Aparo, and then at some point later in this volume, it gets into that what did they call it where they were doing like the new one in a in a straight to the direct market book and then the newsstand one was going to be like year old uh, stories that that was pretty much it it was it was a thing that dc implemented that was called the hardcover soft cover plan mm-hmm. and it was kind of emulating how in the world of book publishing you'd have the hardcover of a novel come out and then a year later it would come out in paperback so they decided to try something like that in the world of comics And this was in sort of the early days of the direct market. So what DC decided to do was take uh, three of their top selling titles, which at the time were New Teen Titans, Legion of Superheroes and Batman and the Outsiders, three superhero group books. And they introduced direct sales uh, versions that were on the, the deluxe paper, the Baxter paper. And, They'd still have stories in the newsstand editions, new stories continuing on for a year. And then after a year's time, they would start reprinting the stories from the Baxter issues. Mm -hmm. So to stay totally up to date on it, you you had to buy the direct market version. Um, So for that first year, you're buying both books, right? So (laughs) mm -hmm. and reading stories kind of in two different points in time. Or you you could just stick with the newsstand version and then just read the deluxe version in a year's time. And <laughs> yeah. e- each one of the books did it a little differently. I know with Legion of Superheroes, Paul Levitz basically just split the team and the newsstand and the direct sales version were simultaneous stories. You know, he had a large enough team that he could do that. Mm. Um, with the Outsiders and the Titans, they both basically skipped ahead in time and then kind of caught up and and it was interesting because then you could kind of tease changes that had yet to come to pass in the books like with uh batman and the outsiders the big hook for the baxter book was they'd split away from batman and they moved over to los angeles and they had a brand new member looker and the the first issue of the the baxter series presented all these as just a fait accompli the new status quo and you had to keep reading Batman and the Outsiders, the newsstand version, to find out how all those changes came to pass. That's all a little ahead of where we are continuity-wise. Right. But 
at the tail end of this trade paperback, that's the reason they brought in the new artist, Alan right. Davis. Because Alan, Jim Alan Apero, Davis, yeah, his, his American debut, issue 22. Exactly right, yeah. Uh, Jim Apero moved over to the Baxter book, and because Jim Apero was a guy who could pencil ink and letter one page a day, hmm. he could only do like one book a month. He, you know, he could do about 20 story pages, 20 working days in a month. And then they still had to have like periodic guest artists. So they hired Alan Davis fresh off of working on Captain Britain and Miracle Man uh, to take over as the artist of the newsstand version of The Outsiders. But that would have just been for a year, right? Because then then it would go to the apparel stuff that was in the Baxter version. It, exactly right. Yeah. And actually, they, they screwed it up a little. Like somebody Not in editorial surprising. or the office miscounted the number of issues they need him for. And oh, so no. he so he was only contracted through like a certain issue. And then they had to like get, I think, a, a, a fill in artist on what should have been his last regular issue. But, mm. you know, oh, some, wow. somebody just miscounted. I think they counted like 12 issues instead of 13, something like that. So this volume has the 1984 annual and then issues 14 mm-hmm. to 23. Now the annual, yeah, it has several different artists. Apparel is just inking and lettering and mm-hmm. pencilers like change with each chapter. Um, got Jerome Moore here, which <laughs> my junior high school principal was Jerome Moore, but not the same guy, I assume. <laughs> Uh, no, not the, not the same guy. This uh, guy has had a long career in comics. He's he's also like worked in animation. I'm I'm Facebook friends with Jerome, and this was, I think, some of his first published work, hmm. if I remember correctly. I, or it's very early on in his career, and he uh, created or co-created the Force of July, the villains in the issue, mm-hmm. and it's and it's uh, the annual is interesting because it's the first time we see the outsiders operating without Batman because Batman's still recovering from an injury he had in in the previous issue. Right. Yeah. He got hit with that blow dart at issue 12 and issue 13. Mm-hmm. He was still recovering. And here, well, he, we see him go out and talk with the cop, but then mm-hmm. he's kind of like, well, I'm, I'm not ready to go out on a mission. So you guys go. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting. He's uh, hardly in this issue. Yeah, so it's it's sort of, he, he's, I, I think it's sort of Mike Barr testing the waters a bit to see, like, well, could the Outsiders, are they strong enough characters to operate on their own? Are readers interested in them without Batman in the book? And I, I guess readers responded favorably because uh, – a little over a year later, he he's having the outsider solo. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, you assume putting Batman in it is a way to sell books. Uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, if you take him out, does do the sales crash? And I guess they didn't. No. Yeah, they they were obviously doing okay. And Geoforce gets a new costume in this issue, uh, mm-hmm. and. <laughs> He was just thinking, gee, I don't like having the costume that looks just like my late sister's and makes me feel sad. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the team walks in here. How about a new costume? Like, OK. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's Batman. He anticipates everything. Uh, this this took place not long after they killed off the character of Tara in the new Teen Titans. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I assume. Do you know about that storyline? Yeah. Um, so. My brother and I did read Teen Titans for a little bit, and it was around the time of Terra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was right after the new Teen Titans annual three, where they killed off Terra. And, you know, the team, uh, 40 year old spoiler here, the team discovered that Terra was, uh, had betrayed them to Deathstroke the Terminator. And she was evil the entire time. (laughs) And, and the, the kind of funny thing is that annual, closes with Tara's funeral and Geoforce and the outsiders are there and the Titans just lie to Geoforce. They say, Oh yeah, she died fighting the Terminator. They're trying to spare his feelings, I guess. Hmm. And at the opening of this annual Geoforce is just like, well, Batman told me you you really betrayed the team and are evil. <laughs> so I guess, I guess Mike Barr didn't agree with that. Mm. Or he didn't think that Batman would agree with that. Right. Yeah. Batman would just, you know, 
let's lay out the truth. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally like Geoforce's new costume a lot better. I, I like the color scheme mm-hmm. with yeah. the, the green and dark yellow. green and gold. And and I always like it when the colors on a superhero team are are balanced. And there wasn't anybody in the group that had green as a predominant color, so it really helped Geoforce stand apart more. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, so this issue, I mean, it's it's uh, kind of riffing on the fact that it's coming out in the year 1984 and mm-hmm. uh, ties in with the George Orwell novel because mm-hmm. we've got this guy, uh, B. Eric Blairman, who thinks, you know, the, the only thing about Big Brother was that he, w- did, he wasn't motivated by you know good so what if right. you had a good big brother uh, yeah <laughs> sure it, out of the goodness of a, your heart you become a dictator yeah um that's a that's a big thing with mike w bar he loved doing plot lines that tied in with current events like you know right after this he does a storyline that ties in with the 1984 olympics that took right. place it, in los angeles mm-hmm. um and yeah since it was it, there was a new attention to George Orwell's book, 1984, he decided to <laughs> have a George Orwell like uh villain with a big brother. And it, it I'd say it's pretty easy to guess uh, Mike Barr's politics from mm-hmm. the story. <laughs> I was, I was really startled when I was rereading the story at one point, the villain literally says tomorrow will make America great again. Yes. And that, that really <laughs> struck me. I was like, Wow. Yeah, hard not to notice that. <laughs> and and he wrote this in 1984 when I mean Donald Trump was I mean this was pre even art of the deal I think. So I don't know if Donald Trump was terribly well known outside of the New York City area. Right. Well, a few years later um he kind of showed up in Bloom County, I remember, but I was kind oh, of yeah. vaguely aware of who he was. That's right. He he switched his brain with Bill the Cat. I remember right. that. <laughs> Maybe that was never undone. I'm not sure. But Maybe. anyway, that would explain a lot. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, this uh, Blairman and you know, Orwell's real name was Eric Blair. Uh, so yeah. tying in with that. And then he's come up with this team, the Force of July, uh, mm-hmm. Major Victory, Lady Liberty, Mayflower, Silent Majority, uh, and sparkler right now lady liberty is french and i guess that's because the french gave the statue to the u.s now a guy Mm -hmm. of this blairman's politics i'm not sure if he would care about that i mean i kind of thought he would say yeah one of those people who say the statue of liberty is completely american uh and (laughs) um so it was a little odd to me that Blairman would think of that. I mean, Barr obviously thought of that, but yeah, um, you know, and also Mayflower is is British. Well, you know, with she's... a highly suspect British accent. I'd... Well, yeah, I think I think it's just as simple as Mike Barr's love of puns and wordplay trumps lots of other considerations. <laughs> so, I mean, they they do seem to basically be white nationalists. Uh, yeah, but but we do have a French person and a British person on the team, uh, <laughs> just just because it ties in with their motifs. So yeah, it, it it's just comic books. It's probably not meant to be examined that that closely. A silent majority is a guy who can make multiple copies of himself, like uh, mm-hmm. what Jamie Madrox in X Men. Um, yeah. Now. What I thought was really confusing was that his name is Gabby with two B's and Halo is Gabby with one B. Um, mm-hmm. Not such a smart idea, I think, to have two characters with such similar names. Yeah, I think I think with Halo, they they said in an early issue that her name rhymes with maybe. So I think it's supposed to be Gabby. But uh, yeah, it is. It is real close. Yeah. Calling him Gabby is probably not the best choice. Right. Um, especially when it's a a medium that you read. I mean, if it were like animated cartoon or something, that would yeah, be a little exactly. bit better. But I mean, if they're Gabby and Gabby, 
Yeah, Mike Mike Barr loves his wordplay, though. He loves his puns <laughs> and he loves his wordplay. Pretty much every set of villains that the outsiders go up against have a pun for a name. Um, <laughs> you know, like still ahead, we have the nuclear family, um, the Duke of Oil. Uh, <laughs> later in this volume, we have the Oracles, sp- spelled like the word aura. <laughs> so mm-hmm. he, he's, he just loves doing that sort of thing. But yeah, about Mayflower's British accent, I mean, I don't know that bloke is ever used as a way to address someone, is it? I'd never heard that. Hey, hey bloke. Um, you do say someone is a bloke, but... Mm-hmm. And she also calls Katana mum at one point. I, that also kind of felt wrong to me. Yeah, I don't know. I guess he's, <laughs> he's just going for quintessential British words. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, just just however he can tag her as British, and he probably couldn't have her say bloody too much. So, mm-hmm. um, But the other thing that stuck out to me here was that uh, Blairman is, has made a tape of mm-hmm. the outsiders apparently, uh, like, attacking the White House, and it's this it's been doctored somehow to look that way, and I was thinking now you could just do AI for that. It'd be a lot easier to to try to explain it. Um, yeah, yeah. He's he's got this supercomputer that allows him to spy on every household in America because it's basically by making TVs two way. Yeah, how do and, you do that? All, <laughs> you know, it, it's a comic book supercomputer. Right. <laughs> I mean, um, and and yeah, he has. He, he alters the footage of the outsiders just fighting some criminals and making it look like they were attacking the White House so to, to frame the team and and say, you know, they're enemies of America and, and therefore you have to give us great discretionary power so we can fight these now non-existent foes because we've killed the outsiders. <laughs> I mean, as, as evil comic book schemes go, it's not a bad one, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, like late in the issue, he's on the phone with somebody who's like, "Oh, November sixth should be no prove no problem," and I'm I'm assuming that was election day in eighty four. Uh, yeah, I didn't, so, didn't check a calendar, but that'd be about right. Yeah, that was my guess. I mean, that's that was the only reason I could think of that he is quoting that specific day because because this, of course, because they're fighting the fourth of July. This issue is taking place in the lead up to the fourth of July. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, okay. The yeah the pencilers in this issue. So Jerome Moore we mentioned chapters mm-hmm. one and five, and the other three chapters Alex Savi Saviuk, Saviuk, uh, Jan Durisma, and Rick Hobers. Hoberg. Uh, ho- okay, I, I guess I got a typo in my notes. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not familiar with any of those those people. Um, well, I mean, like Jerome Moore was a pretty young guy. He was probably, I think, only around 19 or 20 at the time. He'd like just broken into comics and he created or co-created uh, the Force of July. Um, and let's see. Um, Alex Saviak was a bit of a veteran. I think he broke in into the industry sometime in the 70s. And he, he drew a lot of stuff for DC. He drew... Um, he drew a lot of the backup features in Action Comics when it was the backup was rotating among Aquaman, the Atom, and Airwave. He drew like the odd issue of DC Comics Presents or a Superman issue. Jan uh, Dersima uh, was one of, I believe, one of the original students at the Kubert School mm. in the 70s. And so she broke in into the industry in the late 70s, early 80s. She drew... Probably best known still for for uh, penciling the Aryan book, the Aryan Lord of Atlantis, I think was the name of the book, was about a sorcerer in ancient Atlantis. And uh, Rick Hoberg, were, he had a day job in animation, and uh, but also would draw the odd issue here and there. He drew the first Justice League annual in the early 80s, and he was uh, took over as penciler of All-Star Squadron after Jerry Ordway left the book. So, yeah, I mean... Talented guys, I think, because they're all being inked by Jim Aparo in this issue, it it does unify, but it also maybe homogenizes it a little bit. Mm. You can't quite see their distinctive styles for what they 
ordinarily are if if like somebody else was inking them, I think. Because mm-hmm. Apero was kind of a dominant inker, I think. Other thing about the story was that it kind of... So just not too long ago on the show, we talked about uh, Jack Kirby's Captain America Mad Bomb storyline. And mm-hmm. this had kind of the same feel to it. Kind of, you know, the America kind of patriotic angle and yeah, um, somebody who, who has a plan to take over America. And I, and I think Kirby was doing that story around the Bicentennial, 1976. Right, right. right. So, yeah, the bic- yeah. Bicentennial is a big part of that story. Yeah, so kind of a kind of a similar inspiration. Like a significant year rolls around and let, let's do a story about America. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hmm. So the issue ends with uh, Halo, Gabby, going on a date and a a shadowy figure is following her. Yeah. Uh, And then we go to issue 14 and it turns out that it's Geoforce. Brian, is that how you pronounce his name? I think Brian. Okay, because it's an O. hmm, It looks like Brian to me, but it could be Brian, I guess. Um, Yeah, I mean, he's... You know he's from a fictional foreign country, so who knows? I, I think it's, I think it's Brian, but but it could be pronounced differently. I've never asked Mike Barr specifically, <laughs> so. But but yeah, he's following her to quote unquote chaperone her, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, chaperoning I guess includes uh, making a racket with trash cans just when she's about to get kissed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that how you chaperone? <laughs> sure. Um, so then she's angry, and then so she does much more damage on his date uh, in yeah. retaliation, and then he's angry at her, and then they end up kissing. Like what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's kind of an interesting subplot, and you'll you'll notice like he, Mike Barr dropped that pretty quickly, you know, just a few issues later. Mm-hmm. Uh, having Geoforce and Halo romantically involved. I don't know if that was always the plan or if he it was just something he was trying and then he quickly was like, oh, this isn't really working. I don't know. It's it's a, it's also maybe a little creepy when you consider the probable age difference between them because Halo is supposed to be about 16 and we know Brian, Geoforce, is like a grad student. So I'd say he's probably at least... 20 or 21 mm-hmm. you know out of college so yeah i don't know yeah maybe, maybe an editor said mm, that's not such a good idea but yeah i'd have to look was was bar i bar might have been editing himself at this point let me let me look at the credits of this issue um yeah no he was he was the writer and the editor so i i'm assuming the buck stopped him mm-hmm. so, so maybe he just tried it and then was like yeah this isn't working i don't think yeah. So 14 and 15, uh, these issues are drawn by Bill Willingham and Bill Anderson. Uh, and this is the L.A. Olympics story with villain uh, Maxi uh, Zeus. Maxi Zeus, yeah. Um, who I had to look up. He, he first appeared uh, in detective comics 483 in 1979 i was not aware yeah. of him has, has he been in a lot of stories i wouldn't he hasn't been in a whole lot of stories um he was created by denny o'neill and don newton towards the end of denny o'neill's first run at dc um denny o'neill went back to marvel around 1980 ish mm-hmm. i think mm-hmm. and he created this villain um and he's probably he hasn't been used too much subsequently. I, I guess he didn't strike too many people's fancy. Um, I think he's I think he's in the Nightfall storyline. I think he's used in that, if I remember correctly. And he's mm. also used in one episode of Batman the Animated Series, where they played him as kind of a nutty King Tut type, uh-huh. um, where, where they played him a little goofier. Well. It's kind of interesting in the story because even like the prison people don't take him that seriously. And Batman's like, you got to take him just as seriously as the Joker. He's just as dangerous yeah. <laughs> trying to convince the prison officials, let alone the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. I, I don't know if anyone really bought that because <laughs> I don't, I don't know if we ever really saw Maxi Zeus pull off a big scheme as big as the Joker or Rachel Ghoul. 
So, mm. you know, but the, but in this one, he's, he's a little more formidable because he gets a whole team of Greek themed supervillains. So, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a cute thing because um, we're leading up to crisis on infinite earths in 1985. Mm-hmm. So a big thing in, in the DC books at the time was, they the had monitor. cameos by the monitor, yeah. Uh, um, and what's her name? Lyra? Uh, Lila. Yeah, Lila. Yeah. Who uh, became Harbinger in Crisis on Infinite Earths. And, and Barr does a cute thing where he said, where there's a little caption that says, the monitor was created by Marv Wolfman, age 38, of Flushing, New York. Yeah, like he's a little kid and, who's, who's just submitted this idea. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's kind of what he was, what Barr was doing, because one of the features that Marv Wolfman wrote for DC was Dial H for Hero. And the gimmick that they had when they revived that feature in the early 80s was readers could send in their creations to be used. Mm. Like the, there, there were these two teenagers who had these, dials and when they dialed h-e-r-o on Mm. on for the guy it was a watch for the girl it was a locket they transform into a new hero for one hour at a time and there it would it would be a a hero or heroine that the reader submitted and you know it would be like a name and a costume and i think the artist drawing the feature would design the costumes um but it would be like, and, and there'd always be a little caption below saying like, you know, such and so was created by Jake Smith, age 12 from Saskatchewan <laughs> or, or, or wherever they were from. And Harlan Ellison actually sent in a, a character or two. They, they just mm. had to uh, a fill out like a little form that, you know, gave DC the rights to those characters free and clear. Mm. So, yeah. Well, we're talking about the monitor. So in the mm-hmm. second issue uh, of the story where it's drawn by Trevor Von Eden, yeah. on the last page, um, now this really threw me because they had not, Monitor and Lila had not been in this issue. And then suddenly on the last page, uh, right. there's a bit with them and I'd kind of forgotten about them and it wasn't clear from when I first saw this panel, I thought these are people who are in the room with Batman and the outsiders. It was not so obvious that they were looking at a screen. Oh Um, yeah. Yeah. Like who are these people? Who's this? Is is that halo? No. Who is she? And then I, I saw the, satellite that they're on in the second panel mm-hmm. and i kind of it, like okay oh that's what's going on okay but what i still can't figure out is that monitor you know at this point they're not showing his face yet right. and in where you would expect his head to be there seem to be a bunch of orange balls and i'm like what is I, that i think that's just the cushion of his chair okay but but yeah, they they basically had to hide the monitor's appearance, and they basically just only teased him. He was just a man in the shadows, and then mm-hmm. he, his full appearance was finally revealed at the, on the last page of Crisis on Infinite Earths one, yeah, where he's like, "I've summoned you all here, and all these universes are about to die." Um, so, mm. but yeah, I mean, yeah. I I went back and looked at Crisis. We talked about it on the show a year or two or three ago, and I didn't see any cushion like that in his chair. It seems like this is its only appearance. Um, but <laughs> it, it makes it look like he's wearing like an orange judge's wig. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it's maybe a little less successful storytelling. Uh, yeah, maybe they should have cut to the satellite first and then cut yeah. to the monitor and, and Lila on board the satellite. Um, it didn't, it didn't confuse me because they were popping up all over DC's books at this point. So mm. if you were reading any number of DC books, you saw the monitor and Lila, you know, pop up. And, and usually it was like a supervillain would be like, Hey, I need, I, I need to hire somebody or I need some equipment to take down. And, and that's, kind of what the monitor started out as he was just kind of an explanation of he was like a a broker and he he would explain how people got all these super powered sidekicks or something and then when crisis on infinite earth started that kind of went away we find out the monitor is actually kind of a good guy and it's like well why was he supplying bad guys for a couple years (laughs) in dc i never quite understood that i Uh i don't 
I don't know if that was clear in the in the creators' minds or if they just changed their minds or what. I don't mm-hmm. know. So talk a little bit about the main, main story here of these two issues. Mm-hmm. So uh, Zeus is targeting this Olympic athlete named Lassinia Nitokris. And mm-hmm. Batman points out Lassania is another name for Juno, the wife in Greek mythology of Jupiter, the Greek equivalent of the god Zeus. Right. Uh, so he's got like like a crush on her or something. Um, and so then he has his team. So the, at the Los Angeles Coliseum, they show mm-hmm. up and the outsiders are there and they make all the, all the crowd g- g- leave. Uh, and then they have sort of like olympic events uh yeah superhero fight slash olympic events so that was kind of interesting oh and ronald reagan makes an appearance yes yes ronald you know yeah so and batman says like okay well you know if we if we clear out the president and all the bystanders we'll we'll fight my team against yours and we'll decide this yeah and i think batman knows that he's yeah he he knows that Maxie Zeus is, is after this woman, but he, I, I don't think he entirely knows why hmm. yet. But, you know, Batman's <laughs> just trying to protect all the civilians. So, yeah, in the second issue, Batman swipes a police car and he thinks, mm-hmm. I'll apologize to the L.A. police later, but it's their own fault for putting the building so far apart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he tracks down this address. Uh, 14, uh, oh, there's a whole... Yeah, well, here it, when they find there's this, a code name, the Pantheon, the code name is the Pantheon, yeah, one four four Corinthian Road, right. and his detective work here is straight out of Batman sixty six. <laughs> <laughs> the, the original Pantheon was built in the Corinthian style, one hundred forty four feet in diameter and one hundred forty four feet high. So the address is one forty four Cor- Corinthian Road, like <laughs> right. And that's not the only time in this volume that he makes those kind of. Like, well, I guess so, type of uh, detective deductions. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to remember, Mike Barr, he's he's a Silver Age baby. So you're mm-hmm. occasionally going to get the same sort of leaps in logic that you'd get in a Silver Age comic. And that was, that's kind of part of the appeal of the Bronze Age for me, is it's, it, it is a little more realistic and a little more serious than what you'd get in this, the Silver Age because they're writing for a slightly older age group. But, yeah, there's still some of that Silver Age goofiness in there. And th- and that's a good example of that is the 144 Corinthian Road. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, that's where he stays. I mean, the Joker stays at the Ha Hacienda. So why wouldn't <laughs> Zeus have have a pantheon that has a appropriate address and i i have no idea if there's even a corinthian road in los angeles i would suspect not but (laughs) probably not coming up mike barr's characterization of batman stories happening three thousand years apart but also simultaneously the backstories of metamorpho and halo and more first just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases Deconstructing Comics earns a bit of money from your purchase that helps us keep the show going. We really appreciate your support. At To The Bat Poles Podcast, we look at the many sides of our favorite hero, Batman. For example, Encyclopedia Batman. It's the basic formula for escaping from the Siamese human knot. I just recalled it. Civic Responsibility Batman. Only a criminal would disguise himself as a licensed bonded guard. Yet callously park in front of a fire hydrant. Impish humor, Batman. Look at him, Robin. That crooked bird's going crazy. And more. See if you can identify other sides of the Cape Crusader, and then join us at To The Bat Poles podcast. Available wherever podcasts are found or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. Batman has many sides, but can we trust him to save the day? You can be sure if it's Batman. Then with issue 16, we get into the truth mm-hmm. about Halo part one, uh, which is interesting yeah. because parts one, two and three are not in consecutive issues. There are other things that kind of in- interrupt it. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, Halo and her because Halo had no memory of who she really was and the kind of quest for 
her real identity was was the big ongoing subplot of the book for the first couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this was issue sixteen was really our our first indicator of like oh well this is who she is and this is where she's from and Barr had a lot more in store after that yeah so I mean, yeah. I mean what what did you think of that you're you're coming to this for the first time hmm well yeah I kind of liked the mystery and you know mm-hmm. other things cop, pop up and like Batman sends this detective who finds yeah. that she is Violet Harper from Arlington Missouri uh, right. And he finds her parents. But th- then after that, in the subsequent issues, like it came out that Violet Harper wasn't such a good person uh, yeah. and did a lot of bad things. And everybody's kind of angry at her. Uh, yeah. And, and Halo still doesn't remember any of this, even after. Yeah. Halo's like, am I such a bad person? Really? Just like it, she's kind of like, well, this is the case. I'm not sure I want to know what happened to me. Yeah. Um, well, Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Um, Somehow, the resolution of it, I was kind of like, oh, okay. Um, (laughs) It wasn't, it didn't quite pay off for me reading it the first time. The second time, Mm -hmm. it kind of worked a little better for me, but it kind of wasn't what I wanted it to be, I think. Now, do you mean just the Violet Harper stuff or the revelations that we had after that? Well, I I mean, the, the way that it was kind of resolved uh mm-hmm. that i mean we might as well jump ahead um yeah so violet harper well as we had seen she had been killed in europe uh when right. she and her boyfriend who she ended up killing uh, mm-hmm. had obtained this formula and they were probably trying to sell it to some uh nasty government in eastern europe or something yeah uh, if it's and it was it's some sort of highly addictive drug they never specify what kind of drug it is right i think they just say like it makes heroin look like talcum powder yeah that was yeah. um tobias yeah. whale showed up yeah and he was after this formula who who was an old foe of, of black lightning mm-hmm. yeah in, in his solo book right yeah i figured that out yeah so then she was killed by this character was cyanide yeah, and there was that was sort of a revamped version of another Black Lightning foe who who was like Tobias Whale had a, an assassin named Cyanide in pretty much that costume, but it was a male character. And I don't know if Mike Barr or maybe the artist said like, "Hey, that might look better on a woman," and it does. <laughs> <laughs> so I I don't remember if the original Cyanide was killed or anything like that, but. Uh, yeah, um, I, I do like in the issue in issue 16 where we find out that that Halo was was really Violet Harper and we think, oh, that's the end of it. Um, I, right. Th- and it's just a matter of her memory coming back, we think. Yeah. And, and it's there's a couple scenes I really like. I like when Katana comes over to Batman. And she's like, what the hell are you doing about Halo? Like, you know, she's having all these nightmares. She doesn't know who she is. And Batman's like. Well, uh, she's probably from the Midwest. She's most likely a runaway. Her name is likely Violet. <laughs> yeah, this is more Batman 66 uh, reasoning because, like, Violet is yeah. the only color that she hasn't uh, shown in her powers. And maybe it's a subconscious thing that she's not, right. <laughs> not doing Violet light because it's her name. Well, it it helps it helps when the writer is on your side. Yeah. But I, I like that I like that Batman has deduced all of this stuff and he hasn't bothered telling anybody about it. <laughs> He's just like you know, well, I've done A, B, and C. Huh. <laughs> and you know, and of course Katana has really bonded with Halo by this point. They're they're very much a mother daughter relationship. And at the end of the issue, Katana's like, why are we leaving her here with these strangers? She doesn't even remember who these people are. And um, and, and Bruce Wayne, he just says, a child belongs with his parents, and I'm not going to hear anything more about it. And I think that's a great Batman line, you know, especially mm. because he doesn't say a child belongs with her parents. He says a child belongs with his parents. So, yeah, of course, Batman, <laughs> you know, 
what else would Batman think? Put put the child with their parents. That is that is the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, because that's what I want the most. So why wouldn't Halo want mm, that the most? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that's so. true. It ties into Batman's history. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, we've got part Batman 66 here as far as the detective work, but other mm-hmm. Batman attitudes are more modern Batman, like not yeah. telling people stuff. And like when yeah. they go to the JLA satellite at the start of issue 22, um, yeah. and he's all like, I told them this wasn't going to work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that he, of course, had designed the security system and included an override that nobody knew about. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very early, you know, the, the kind of paranoid control freak Batman that we've had for, you know, most of the last 30 odd years, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, I remember that was that was a little off putting to me at the time. I was like, oh, but, you know, he's he's friends with everybody in the Justice League. Why is he calling them those fools? <laughs> yeah, he's um, not super yeah. friends, Batman. <laughs> he, no, he's not. He's not. And I'm you know, and I'm reading this at around 12 or 13. So I still had a bit of attachment to that sort of Batman. Um, but. Yeah, I think, you know, Mike Barr, he he likes he, you know, he does have some Silver Age in his Batman, but he's also got some of that uh, Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams mm-hmm. stuff mixed in there too. Um, so, and and he he strikes a pretty good balance between those two, I think. Mm-hmm. So, and and he, you know, Mike Barr is also a good mystery writer. He he's, I know he's a big Ellery Queen fan, mm-hmm. and um, you know, he wrote when he was doing detective comics with Alan Davis, they, they did an issue that had a Sherlock Holmes homage. So he's, he's a big mystery fan. He, he writes a good mystery. Yeah. So the, the explanation for Halo is that after Violet died, uh, this mm-hmm. alien being took over the body and, and yeah. had no memory of being an alien being. And of course, no memory of being Violet Harper. Right. What are, what yep. are these people, these aliens called? The oracles. The oracles. Yeah. Yeah, because it's A U R A, occults. You know, again, Mike Barr loves his puns. <laughs> um, it's, mm. If you if you are reading Batman and the Outsiders, get used to puns. That would be my number <laughs> one bit of advice. If you don't like puns, that might not be the book for you. <laughs> Yeah, so in in issue twenty two, it's part three of that story is when they they figure this out, and then the oracles yeah. like want to want that oracle to reunite with them and get out of that body, and she doesn't want to, and so right. the fourth issue, issue twenty three, is a whole like sort of convincing the oracles to to let her remain in this body. Yeah, yeah, because because the oracles, they're, you know, this alien group mind thing and and they're I guess they they feel diminished if one of them is is not in the group consciousness. Um, And and Batman's like, well, no, you can't have her back. She's like a human woman now. So (laughs) screw you, alien beings. (laughs) I you know, I, I like at the end, they're like, you know, but our consciousness is still depleted and Batman's just. Remind me to feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Batman could not give less of a shit no. about these aliens. It's kind of hilarious. Yeah, he's he's not Super Friends Batman or Adam West Batman. He's no, you know, the, not at all. Kind of a colder Batman. Yeah, yeah, that's very much like Grim Avenger Batman. <laughs> right. Where, you know, I mean, he he will. Batman, especially a Mike Barr Batman, he's always, always, always going to side with the victims over the bad guys. Hmm. Yeah, and this is still a couple years before Frank Miller, Dark Knight Returns, so he's not quite that grim and gritty yet, but kind of leaning in that direction. Yeah, but I mean, you know, Mike Barr and Frank Miller were friends, and I know they kind of exchanged ideas with about Batman. I mean, Mike Barr ended up doing Batman Year 2 right after Batman Year 1 finished up. Hmm. So... And, you know, it wasn't quite as successful as year one for a variety of reasons, but uh, there was definitely some crossover in their conceptions of Batman, I would say. Okay, so let's talk about Metamorpho. 
Uh, okay. In issue 16, which is the title is The Truth About Halo, but it's also mm-hmm. starting this story about Metamorpho, um, right. who had broken up with his girlfriend, Sapphire Stag. Now, did this happen in some other book at some point? Well, I mean, Metamorpho, um, you know, when, when, when Mike Barr and Jim Aparo created The Outsiders, they, they introduced three original characters, Halo, Katana, and Geoforce. And, you know, he, of course, had Batman in there. And then he had two pre-existing characters, which who were Black Lightning and Metamorpho. And Metamorpho was a character that dated from the 60s and was co-created by Bob Haney and uh, Ramona uh, Freydon, who actually just passed away a few weeks ago mm-hmm. um, at the age of 97. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and, wow. and she'd only like officially retired like maybe a month before. Mm. Um so yeah, Ramona Fraden was she she had a long run on Aquaman in, in the early sixties, I believe, and then she did Metamorpho a little later. And and Metamorpho was kind of DC's attempt to do a more offbeat type character of the, the type that Marvel was doing. But because the people at DC maybe didn't entirely get what Marvel was doing, <laughs> he's 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 kind of goofy. I mean, he's uh, he's he's like this adventurer, this Indiana Jones type, and he goes to Egypt and he's exposed to this 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 orb, this meteorite that transforms him into a freak. And he he has his love interest, Sapphire Stag, who's this sort of spoiled rich girl, and her father is this evil billionaire, Simon Stag, and Simon Stagg, he has a as his bodyguard this this dethawed caveman named Java. He, he really is literally a dethawed caveman. He li- really literally is, I and see. amazingly okay. enough, that is not the only dethawed caveman character that Bob Haney created for DC. <laughs> he liked that trope. He had a character named uh, Nark in in the Teen Titans. <laughs> Mm. Or Gnark, or I, I don't, I'm not sure how it was pronounced. It's like you know, G N A A R K, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but Bob Haney liked his dethawed caveman. <laughs> so yeah, so so Metamorpho was was kind of a goofier, more humorous type of strip, and I think that was part of the appeal for Mike Barr. He was like, well, can I take this goofy Silver Age character and make him mesh with Batman and have him make sense on the team and I'd say he pulled it off for the most part. I see. So okay. your your mileage may vary on that. <laughs> uh, so apparently Metamorpho broke up with Sapphire because he's got this kind mm-hmm. of inferiority complex about himself with his powers and his looks and thinking she right. should date somebody normal, but he can't right. forget about her and she can't forget about him. Yeah. So uh, he ends up uh, getting in touch with, with uh, her again. And they get right. back together, and he's, but Java is also interested in her, and and he has to kind of fight yeah. Java, and we get some like we, he knocks out Java, and and Java has these like birds <laughs> tweeting around his head like it's Looney Tunes. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that that would be a thing that they they brought over from the Metamorpho strip. It was a much cartoonier, more humorous strip. Mm. So yeah, kind so of that's, in the vein that's of Plastic of, Man. Yeah, that's a good comparison. He. And I, I think they'd even like Metamorpho and Plastic Man had teamed up with Batman in Brave and the Bold a couple times, um, you know, probably because they were more humorous characters. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. OK. Uh, and so Metamorpho had gotten this device from Dr. Jace uh, yeah. that would kind of supposed to protect him from the orb of Ra. Uh, right. That her that uh, Simon Stagg has and was what uh, turned him into Metamorpho in the first place. Yeah, that that was a thing from the original Metamorpho strip, I believe. And I haven't read too many of those. I sort I sort of just know them from you know, Osmosis from other comics, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. but uh, Simon Stagg had a bunch of orbs of Ra uh because we find out later he went back to Egypt and got more pieces of that meteorite and made mm-hmm. more orbs and all of this orbiness uh, turns uh, <laughs> Metamorpho into just kind of a pile of slop. And yeah. Dr. J says, well, he's dead, but he's not normal. So maybe there's a way to bring him back. 
Yeah, he's only mostly dead. <laughs> it's it's very Princess Bride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so they take him to Egypt to be exposed to the meteorite again. And right. it makes him look normal, but it also takes him and their whole group, including Batman, Dr. Jason, Sapphire, and the Outsiders minus Halo, uh, right. takes them back to Egypt 3,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. During the reign of Ramses the Seventh, Yeah. And, and we kind of discover over the course of the storyline that was what was supposed to happen when Rex Mason was first transformed into Metamorpho. And... There's like a bit of a mystery, like, oh, there was something that prevented this from happening when he first turned into him, mm-hmm. and they, they don't really know what. And then Sapphire finally realizes what it was. Um, right, and it was like he had taken some kind of pain pill? Yeah, like, you know, some kind of tranquilizer or something. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he was he, he thought he was going to die from the radiation, so he was like, well, if i got to be burned to death, I'm not going to feel it. And <laughs> and that apparently was enough to prevent this from happening. And, w- and when they travel back in time, he's... Uh, he's under the the mental control of this evil uh, uh, Octon. pharaoh type, yeah, yeah. Octon, um, who, who's, who's trying wants, to become, who wants to yeah. stage a coup against Ramses, uh, right? And yeah, he's controlling uh, Metamorpho, um, and of course, eventually they figure out a way to snap him out of the control, and uh, they well, and then there's this whole aspect of, like Batman's worried about changing the timeline. Because mm-hmm. Ramses is not supposed to be taken down by a coup, his line is supposed to continue on, and so they're like, "Well, we have to preserve the timeline, even if it means Metamorpho dies." Um, yeah. So, but you know, that's just you know raising the stakes. But of course, everything comes out the way it's supposed to. Yeah, yeah. They they manage to preserve the timeline and and save Ramses and and get Metamorpho back to normal. So. Everything's hunky dory by the end, and, and Sapphire proposes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's like, you know, quit beating yourself up. Will you marry me? But I loved how, and if you see, you see this in other things too. I think, but I think Barr is very consciously doing it. It's a time travel story, and he has a caption. Meanwhile, back in the past, like this is the very antithesis uh-huh. of meanwhile. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I, I, I think. He he has to be doing that at least half ironically. Mm-hmm. I mean, because he, I think he's too smart of a writer not to be doing that. Right. Um, I mean, cause, because he didn't just say meanwhile. He said meanwhile back in the past. Those two things right, contradict right. each other, and I'm I sure mean, he it, knows he, that. Yeah, but he just wants to space out the issue with the Halo subplot, and she's separated from the rest of the team. So. And there's really no, you know, to the reader, they're taking place more or less simultaneously. But, uh, <laughs> you know, of course, it's thousands of years apart. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because the story is interspersed with what's going on with Halo in Missouri. Right. Uh, and right. her being accused of killing this this girl's brother who was her mm-hmm. boyfriend. Um, and then we've also got Denise Howard. Yeah. And the intro to her in the earlier issues I thought was kind of weak because, um, I mean, there. so, okay, Brian met her at school in issue nine. Um, yeah. And then she doesn't appear again until issue 14 uh, in yeah. class for a few panels. And it's taught by this Professor Rayburn. And she gets a scholarship application from him in number 15. And then we don't see her again until 18. And I wasn't really tying it all together. I had to kind of flip back and and see where she had appeared before. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because um, because there wasn't a whole lot that was real memorable about her before no. this subplot kicks into high gear. No, she was just like some other kid in his class. Yeah, she was just the brainy check. Yeah, there wasn't enough to say. Pay attention, you know. Remember this because we're going to come mm-hmm. back to it. So then in 18, uh, Professor Rayburn tries to put the moves on her and he won't fill out the application unless she gets romantic with him. Right. And she won't. So he tears up the application. Yeah. Uh, And then she goes back to her room uh, and OD's on sleeping pills. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then because because, I mean, you know, she's dependent on this scholarship and she just doesn't see any future if. She can't mm-hmm. continue her studies because she's just like this total brain. And I think 
I will say that the way they present that, it 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 comes off as so melodramatic. It it almost plays a little humorous. Like she's she's like literally like scrubbing floors because she's flunked out of school. Ah, uh, in her um, imagination, yeah. In her imagination, and I mean, I realize when you know she's of course in a suicidal ideation um, at that moment. So she's she is of course not thinking straight, but. I wish it played like a little more poignant and a little less cartoony. I think even, even on my first reading of that, when back in the eighties, I thought, okay, that's maybe a little much. <laughs> yeah. It's a little, yeah. You know, I don't know yeah. if obvious is the right word, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I didn't quite buy that she would go that far to take the sleeping pills. Yeah, yeah. They maybe hadn't quite established like how important her studies were to her. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they could have done more to establish Denise as a character, you know, both to fix her in the readers' minds, like she wasn't quite with you, and and also to to set up this subplot. But I think after that moment, I think it I think it's generally well done. Yeah. Um, and so before she uh, falls unconscious, she calls Brian and tells mm-hmm. him what happened. And yeah. so he and who is, oh yeah, he's back together with Halo. This is where, where they've decided that they're going to be more brother and sister at the start of issue 19. Yeah. They basically break up and they're like, yeah, we're, and, and they're both kind of like, this was a mistake. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Halo's like, yeah, I was so strung out of her finding my parents and who I really was. And, and, and Geoforce is like, yeah, and I was I was like grieving for my my twin sister, mm-hmm. and you know I felt like I did I never gave her the love that I needed to give her. So, right. uh, yeah, I don't know if that entirely works, but I don't know if they re- entirely worked as a couple. So you know, fine, <laughs> we'll, let's roll with it. <laughs> well, I mean the the part about uh, Tara kind of makes sense to me that he was missing mm-hmm. his sister and. And maybe he wants to see her as more, more a sister in that right. mold. Yeah, yeah. I th- I think that works. I think that works. I mean, especially you know, because because they were really sort of only tangentially created uh, connected with Tara over in the the Teen Titans. I mean, really, the only reason they became brother and sister in the first place was because Mike Barr and Marv Wolfman both happened to create characters with Earth powers around the same time, and they just thought, okay, well, let's make them related, so it's not as huge of a coincidence right so we should mention this issue 19 is a christmas issue mm-hmm. uh, and the title is who's afraid of the big red s because uh superman is called in to stop geoforce from killing this professor who put the yeah. moves on uh denise uh yeah. and so it's a battle between geoforce and superman and of course superman mm-hmm. wins um, yeah. and <laughs> he says best workout I've had in a long time. <laughs> I mean, Geoforce does give him a run for his money. I mean, he uses his powers in a really creative way. I like when mm-hmm. he, he uses his control over gravity. He's like, well, what if I make the gravity as strong as Krypton and that will start to weaken you. And then he just starts punching the hell out of Superman. <laughs> and we see Superman bruised at the end of the fight, which you didn't really see Superman get bruised or beaten up like that in no. in most comics this is a pre john byrne superman so he was he was invulnerable with a capital i <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and it was it was nice to see a superhero fight that isn't predicated on a misunderstanding where each that's one true. thinks the other one is the bad guy um, yeah that's, it's not that it is, it's superman trying to keep uh geoforce from committing a crime yeah, and Geoforce, I mean, he was he was like the most hot headed of the outsiders. I was well, maybe him and Katana. But you know, Geoforce, he is righteously pissed off about what has been done to his friend. And he and he goes to the Professor Rayburn's, he's got, you know, this winter cabin, and Rayburn's such a scumbag he already has another woman there. Yeah, and I so I mean she seems very, very willing, but I was wondering like, yes. is she another student or uh <laughs> hard to tell I, I, you don't know it's it's never clarified and at, at the very end batman waltz is in and he's like yeah i figured you probably tried this before so here are seven sworn affidavits from other women you've tried this with and they'll be seeing you in court yeah and, he gets totally me too 
<laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> and Batman, he pulled this off in maybe a couple of hours. I was like, wow, you you tracked down and got signed affidavits from seven different women. Well, it's the Bat Computer. The Bat Computer can do anything. So <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. I, when I was rereading it, I'm like, damn, you found those women fast, Batman. <laughs> and and, and Batman out just a says like card when this said is, these names on it. Yeah. I mean, and I like that Batman just turns to Geoforce and says, when the system works, use a Geoforce. When it doesn't or it can't, that's what we're for. So I, I like that. I like that Batman is willing to use the system when it when it works for him. And if it doesn't, he has no hesitation about going outside the law. So, yeah, I thought that this this is one of my favorite issues of the run. I think I think it's a lot of fun. And I, I really like that page that first introduces Superman, where it's Clark Kent just singing Christmas carols with yeah. the Daily Planet staff Daily Planet Christmas party. Yeah, and then and then he sneaks out to change in the storeroom, and it's and it's very you know like Fleischer cartoon where he's like changing in silhouette and then he's flying over the city and some kid sees him and his mom's like, Oh, do you see Santa? And he's like, even better. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a great page. I, w- I would love to own that page. So issue 21, I'm not sure why this was here, but it's three solo stories. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of, almost kind of a filler. I think it's still bar, right? Bar is still writing, but he did, he did write all three stories. Um, I think this is likely just one of those issues where we're buying Jim Aparo a little time. Mm-hmm. So we get we get three fill in artists each drawing like a eight to ten page story. Right. And Trevor Von Eden, Jerome Moore, and Ron Randall, who's been on the show before. Oh, oh, cool. All right. Um yeah, and and you know, of course he's worked with uh Trevor and, and Jerome before. You know, they're both in sort of Mike Barr's regular circle of artists, so he obviously liked what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, it's interesting. The 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 katana story is sort of a Will Eisner tribute or ah. a Will Eisner homage. He's he's trying to do a spirit type story where it, the story is basically narrated in a radio broadcast of a football game. Right, um, and and everything that's happening in that game is is reflected in the story that we're seeing. There's no dialogue; right. it's all just this radio announcer. Right, right, and and Katana is basically protecting this priceless uh, vase from like the Ming Dynasty or or somewhere. I'm assuming, um, and you know, she's trying to get it to the the Gotham Museum, and there are bad guys who are out to steal it. Um, so, the, so the vase is basically the football, and Katana is like the star quarterback. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought it was well done. Uh, like and it's one. it's a cute story. I mean, it's it's the type of story idea that can sustain itself for uh, what is it, seven pages, and you know, more than that, I think it would get a little too precious. But I think it works perfectly well for seven pages. Or, yeah, eight. Well, eight, yeah. eight. I guess. Well, I guess that first page is just the splash of the whole issue. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm seven, looking at it. Two, uh, four, it is, six, yeah, it is. Seven. It is seven pages. Because yeah. um, I think I think this is what issues were like twenty one or twenty three pages around this time. So yeah, I maybe, think it's. Well, yeah, it's, it's mentioned there on that first page because. Uh, Halo is saying, what a bummer, Metamorpho. All the outsiders get solo stories but us. And Metamorpho yeah. says, only 23 pages to an issue, Shiny. Someone's got to lose, but don't worry. Right. Mike and Alan promise us solo adventures in the next special issue. Yeah, so I just I just double-checked. It looks like the Katana and Black Lightning pages, our stories are both seven pages long, and then the Geo4 story is eight pages long. Hmm. So that's uh, 14 plus another eight. So that's 22 plus the splash page. So that's 23 pages. Yep. So, right. So the Geoforce story is happening at like a water park, uh, that's mm-hmm. run by a Mr. Waters. <laughs> is that his name? Yeah. It's headed I, I by Mr. Forgotten. Waters. Uh, yeah. And, and, the, and the scientist is named like nerdly, nerdly. or something like yes. Yeah. Nerdly. Quentin nerdly. So, <laughs> It's obviously a half humorous story, um, mm. and and you know this is this of course is coming out only a year or so after like Jaws 3D. So <laughs> I think it's I think it's Mike Barr having a little fun with that because that you know that was a similar premise as a like you know a, a real shark loose at a water park like a sea world type environment. So yeah, well, Nerdly was supposed to like I don't know why you get a scientist to do this, but to devise a uh, mascot. 
Uh, yeah, I, and, I think he, it was supposed to be this animatronic thing. Yeah, and he's made this this uh, like kind of robot shark that right. they, they need, you know because he gets PO'd at the owner, then he just sets mm-hmm. it loose on the park, and Geoforce right. has to get it under control. Right. And he also meets the reporter, Joan Lincoln, who was kind of a recurring presence hmm. in in this book. And I think also in, in Barr's Batman stories in general. So, yeah. Okay. And, and you know, the implication at the end of the story is that it might be like perhaps a romantic interest. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think he ever did much more with that. But, uh, you know, may, maybe it's just uh, her swooning over him because he's so he's so dreamy. <laughs> Right. And then the last story is Black Lightning against a guy called Ghetto Blaster, who is like, he's got this kind of almost like the shocker uh, device that he's using to to knock down buildings. And he's trying to uh, he's explaining it as like he's kind of getting revenge on the man or something and tearing down the slums. But actually it turns out that he's looking for some stolen money that was hidden somewhere. And because he got a head injury, he forgot where it's hidden. So, so it happens every day. Yeah. (laughs) I'm, I'm kind of amazed given Mike Barr's love of puns and and stuff that the ghetto blaster doesn't have like a boom box type weapon <laughs> that he's blasting the, the slums with. He, no, he actually has a super suit and he's like blasting it out of his hands. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, that's kind of admirable restraint for Mike W. Barr. <laughs> Cause if he's calling him the ghetto blaster, you'd think he'd have a boom box. Yeah. But... Um, hmm. And and you know of course we've got to because Jefferson Pierce is is a teacher in his secret identity, he he he's brought into this because one of his students has been cutting school for a week and he's he's he believes in the ghetto blaster because he thinks the the ghetto blaster is sticking it to the man, right? So. <laughs> um, and then of course at the end the kid comes back to school, quits, right. quits skipping. Yeah, and he he's brought back all his homework because he he realized that you know he was he was just a, another crook who was playing them all for suckers. <laughs> so it, it's a cute story. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we've covered pretty much everything here. Anything that we missed? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's fun seeing Alan Davis come in at the tail end. I mean, and it's a real mm-hmm. early Alan Davis too. I yeah. mean, it was, and I remember when I. I first saw like my first glimpse of Alan Davis's work because I wasn't I wasn't reading uh, Miracle Man or Captain Britain or anything like that. So I'd never heard of Alan Davis before. Mm. And the first thing I saw of him was that pinup that he did of Batman and the Outsiders at the tail end of this trade. Um, And they looked so different. I was like, I don't know if I like this guy, (laughs) Um, but but he really grew on me with time. And, And I think he also really improved on the book too. He got mm. more of a feel for the characters. And uh, by the end of the next storyline with that they did with Cobra, which you'll find in the beginning of the next trade paperback, I was, I was loving Alan Davis. I was a big fan. And uh, Barr and Davis obviously liked working together because they, they did, they worked together quite a bit and they've come together a number of times since then. Um, they did a all too short run on detective comics after they did Batman and the outsiders and uh, they've reunited a few times since. It's it's been a while though, because uh, Alan Davis has been exclusive to Marvel for a number of years at this point. But mm-hmm. you know, it's it's fun seeing Alan Davis. What, I mean, how did you like these stories? This is your first time going through with them. Yeah, it was mostly mostly pretty entertaining. I mean, you can find mm-hmm. problems with each of them in different ways, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed this overall. Yeah, I mean, I think. It's a fun book. It's it's a good mixture of goofy and serious. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, Batman. He's generally serious with Batman. Mm-hmm. I mean, he will. He might have the occasional uh, humorous scene with, like, you know, Batman being amused by something or something. But he's he's never mm-hmm. really mocking Batman or playing him as silly. With a character like Metamorpho, he'll he'll get a little more silly. Yeah, when when they're in Egypt before they get sent back to the past, and Batman mm-hmm. is getting into that dark pyramid, and he says, "Oh, it reminds me of home." <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's just he's like in the shadowy crypt, and he's like, "Ah, I'm right at home, yay!" <laughs> and 
you know, like a thing that always kind of weirded me out about Batman and the Outsiders when I was reading it, even even at the time, was, you know, Batman traditionally doesn't kill his foes. Mm -hmm. But he has Katana on his team who will just kill people without any compunction. And Batman's just like, oh, well, that's what that's what she does. All right. She's <laughs> taking the care of these people for us. OK, let's move in. Yeah. He's yeah. Not, not like Katana, don't kill people. But it's nobody. It's nobody weird. expresses any problem with that. And I mean, Black Lightning is the only one who ever expresses any uh, misgivings about Katana killing people right <laughs> and left. And it, it does seem weird that Batman is never like, hey, if you're working for me, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's, he's just like, oh, well, he, she impaled another guy. What you going to do? Right. Because in, in uh, issue 23, they go to Japan because they mm -hmm. there's something there that they need to rescue Halo. And right. yeah, they send Katana in to the Japanese mafia headquarters. And right. I mean, you know, it's you don't actually see blood, but it's pretty clear that these guys are not uh, probably not going to make it out of this fight. It's like somebody's no, getting no. a sword yeah. run through them. And yeah, it's, it's very code approved. In the uh -huh. yeah, there, there isn't any blood. We just see lots of stabbing and lots of people falling over. Yeah. And the sword going yeah. through this guy is kind of covered up by another panel. So you can't see it coming out of his back. Or it's or it's off panel, yeah, yeah. It, you know, like I mean, Frank Miller always did that thing in Daredevil when like Electra would run somebody through with a sigh. You would just you wouldn't see the sigh actually penetrating. You just see suddenly like the back of their jacket would be poking out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was it was like just the moment before it broke through the cloth. And I guess that's kind of how they got around the comics code. Because <laughs> um, if it, if it was more bloody or explicit, they they might have had a problem with that. Mm -hmm. You know, but but it, if if you depict it like this, you could probably be like, oh, no, no, she's just wounding them. <laughs> it's going through his, his underarm, his armpit. Yeah, it's not going right. through she, him. She's just knocking them out. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're just sleeping. They're all tuckered out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, or, or you know, if, if you want to really back away from it, you could just be like, oh, she treats her 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 sword with a knockout drug or something like that. <laughs> You know, you. I mean, I suppose you could do that if you really wanted to, but I'm sure in Mike Barr's mind, she is killing these people right and left. <laughs> yeah. And th I, this might be the last time that they ever did the thing with Katana Sword where it, it's actually captured the souls of anybody it's killed mm. because they actually summon the Oracle to to get the information about where the Oracles took Halo to, uh, which, which is a, a neat bit of tie-in. Mm -hmm. uh, with the continuity and it brings back the Japanese mob boss from the, the Katana origin story. So. Yeah. And the yeah. Japanese written on the wall there is still wrong, but still <laughs> it's consistent. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I, re I remember you, you noting that the last time, I think they probably just went with, Oh, this is a cool looking character. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. I mean, well, I mean is, when, is when, any... when she reads that in incantation and it's written out, uh -huh. and like some of those I recognize as, actual Chinese Japanese characters and others I uh -huh. do not. <laughs> okay. So it's, she's not saying anything uh, discernible, right? Not to me. Uh, it, yeah. it seems kind of like it's just random characters and or yeah. random things that look kind of like characters. <laughs> I, I seem to remember, you know, it's kind of a shame that this trade doesn't reprint the letters pages too, because mm. Batman and the Outsiders had a very lively letters page because Mike Barr would respond to the letters directly. Uh. And I, I remember at one point, um, some reader took him to pass to, to task for the inaccurate Japanese mm. in the book. And they were just like, pick up a Japanese to English phrase book. I beg you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Mike Barr was just kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't really care. And it honestly, it kind of amuses me that if she's speaking Japanese when she's like slicing somebody apart, she's really saying like, excuse me, could you give me directions to the nearest florist? <laughs> uh, I, I think he was, I think he probably just thought um, the, the number of readers who are probably fluent in Japanese is such a small fraction of it. Mm. It's probably more trouble than it's worth. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think these days they would probably take the time and the effort to 
make sure that it was real Japanese and have somebody translate it. But Mm -hmm. back then, I mean, Marvel was guilty of the same thing. I have examples. So, I mean, also, I don't think the overseas market uh, back then was what it was as what it is today. I I don't think it was. I, I don't know how much DC reprinted in other countries. I know they did a bit of that, but I don't think they did a great, great deal of it. And, I, and who knows if they had any market in Japan. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, so fill us on, a, fill us in on what you're doing lately. Oh, what am I doing lately? Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still writing for, for back issue. I haven't appeared in, in the pages of back issue in a little while since, since the last time I've been, uh, in in back issue magazine, I have had a big feature on Starman, uh, DC's book from the '90s, with uh, mm-hmm. with uh, the character Jack Knight taking over. And I, I got to do an extensive interview with James Robinson and Tony Harris. Uh, that appears in back issue number one thirty three, and that and that was like a dream come true for me because that's <laughs> that was probably my favorite book of the '90s. Mm. And um, there might be a possibility that those two could get back together and do another Starman story. Oh, wow. Um, I don't think anything's been officially announced, but I hear things. I hear rumblings. Okay. You might want to keep an eye out for that. Okay. If you, if you were a fan of Starman back in the day, I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't necessarily have any inside information, but keep an eye out. You mm-hmm. might hear something in the next year or so. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I should be popping up again there in the future. It's it's probably a little premature to to say. Um, I still have uh, my own podcast uh, with my buddy Darren Patterson. We do a podcast called the SNL Nerds, where we talk about Saturday Night Live and uh, the various movie spinoffs uh, or, or various movies that cast members have done. And we've been doing that for about five years, and it's still a lot of fun. Uh, it's called the SNL Nerds, and if you'd like to check it out. We would appreciate that. Okay. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. All right. Great. Well, uh, thanks for coming back to do this. And maybe we can do volume three sometime. Hopefully not a whole two years from now, maybe sooner than that. But <laughs> That would be fun. I, I enjoy this. It's a, it's a fun blast from the past uh, read this book again, because I, w- I read it for pretty much the entire run. And I was I was subscribing from fairly early on. Uh, so it's it's fun to revisit these. Batman and the Outsiders is published by DC. If you're enjoying this podcast, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics and go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on X, Facebook, or YouTube. Via our site, you can also shop on Amazon to support the show and find links to subscribe to the podcast. You can comment on any episode there or drop us a line at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. And now you can also send us a voicemail find the leave a voicemail link on the left sidebar of our site are you making a comic send it to us and we'll do a critiquing comics episode about it our theme is by jb anderton next week i'm joined by cbr's ashley land going back to the early 70s to look at the first volume of len ween and bernie wrightson's original swamp thing series till then this is tim and thanks for listening to deconstructing comics